Good morning, church. Mr. Deal was extremely eloquent, as you heard, Griffin, and I'm going to resist a matter because some of the issues that he has written on, I've written a couple of books on, but I'm not here to deal with social issues, but to speak as the Lord has led me from his word. And let me tell you, it is an awesome responsibility to attempt to be God's servant. Let us pray. Father, you know how nervous I am. You know how unworthy I am. But your command is to preach the word and to allow the word to speak for itself and accomplish what you want it to accomplish. So, Lord, speak your word through me. And if there be any glory and praise, it belongs all to you. Amen. Turn with me in the Bible to John chapter 4. And while you are in the process of turning, let me join my, my wife and myself and my family. Let us join in congratulating the Christian Council on the 28 years of helping hurting people in New Providence and Abaco. It's an exemplary model. It's non-denominational, but church-enabled. Fee-paying and non-profit, but not turning anyone away because they cannot afford it. And it does not receive any government subvention, not subject, therefore, to government influence, but totally dependent on God's people. And indeed, we give God thanks. Because if they have been operating as a viable institution for 28 years, they must be doing something right. Let me also salute Pastor and Mrs. Arnett for consistent, continuous, committed leadership and dedication. It, it takes real faith to give up material gain for Christian service, but God is no man's debtor. And therefore, let us salute these two faithful brethren among us who has led in this way. I'm going to read John chapter 4 from verse 4 to 30, and then 39 to 42. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a, a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, 
give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say, I have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet the time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you. Am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went into the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told everything, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. This is the longest conversation recorded in the New Testament. And every counseling situation is indeed a long, personal, confidential conversation. This is the essence of counseling. And therefore, I'm not, I will, I'm not going to try to make correspondences between the Christian Counseling Center and, and, and this passage, or for any one of us who are engaged in counseling. I'm just saying, look at the essence. Look at the moves of this conversation. Look at verse 4. And you see compulsion. Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Some have argued it's because of physical fatigue. I think the very passage dismisses that argument because if you look at verses 31 to 38, which I left out of the reading, you will see Jesus having a discussion with, with his disciples who brought back the food and Jesus and said, Master, you must eat something and he says to them i have food to eat that you know not of and my my food is to do the will of the father so it wasn't a matter of physical need it seems more that he needs he had to go the, the, the compulsion come because he had to meet this woman and he had to bring the gospel to samaria because he was not about to exclude samaria from the gospel, and the Jews had excluded them in establishing Judaism, if you go back at the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, when the great assembly was established. There was compulsion, 
to include the Sumerians and collectively, and there was compulsion to meet the woman personally. This was a private, personal conversation. And their common point of need was water. In fact, the well is still there. It's one of the few historical places that we knew that Jesus sat. It's 135 feet deep. They measured it in 1938. And it has about 12 to 15 feet of water in it all the while. The well is still there. He needed a drink. She need, needed to draw. And they both met. And at that point of common connection, the water, Jesus begins a conversation by asking her for a favor. Could you give me a drink? And in so doing, he contravened in verse 7, in verse 9, custom at three levels. First, as a man talking to a woman in those times, this is not supposed to happen. Secondly, Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Samaritans. And thirdly, he was being made ceremonially unclean by accepting a drink from a Samaritan. And so he was compromising himself in the customs of the times. And she was not about to overlook that. And so in verse 9, she's very respectful. Sir, you are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman, and you are asking me for a drink? And the Jews do not support. Notice gender, nationality, and religion. Barriers always between people who begin personal conversations. And she is not about to overlook that. Notice that she begins the conversation on the temporal level, with history, the baggage of history behind it, all of the customs and conventions of the times and the restrictions and the barriers, Jesus is not quite there. And so Jesus said, sidesteps that challenge. And he says to her, and he makes an offer, as you will see in, 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 in verse 10, he makes an offer of grace. The gift of God, of salvation and eternal life. And he uses the metaphor of living water. Living water that springs up as a well, fresh and flowing. Salvation and the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you knew who it was that was talking to you and the gift of God, you would ask me, Jesus is on the spiritual level. And the eternal level, she's on the temporal and the material and the historical level. Notice many times when people are involved in conversations, they are talking past each other. And, 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 and Jesus is posing that metaphor. And she isn't understanding the metaphor. And she gives him a common sense rebuttal. Sir, she says, what are you trying to do? Put me on? You have nothing to draw with. How can you give me some water to drink this water? Um, if she was a Trinidadian, she would be saying, don't mama guy me. If she is a Jamaican, she'd say, you are a ginal. I don't know quite the Bahamian, but it may be... <laughs> It may be, listen, you're sounding like a sweet mouth man, offering much that you cannot deliver. Look, she says, and she must know, I, I have had to do with a lot of men, and don't try, don't, don't, I have experience. Look. And Jesus, in verses 13 to 14, gives a fuller description of the qualities of this living water. And he says to her, 
Look, you have given a little, little but it, it will be like fresh water. And, and, and when he gives her the explanation, she says, look, let me, give me this water. Because if you give me this water, I will not be thirsty and I will not have to come here again. She was accepting it on the basis of convenience. Well, let me tell you, God doesn't give us the gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit for convenience to deal with the issues. He's given it for eternal life. And so she, she, she now wants, to, yes, God are interested with having given her this metaphor of a water. And she's seen the, the, the temporal and physical convenience of it. And so he returns to custom. He says, now, if I'm going to give you something, if I give you something without your husband being present, I'm compromising you. Jesus is not rebuking her in sending her for her husband. He's saying to her, in the custom of the day, if I am going to give you this gift, go call and bring your husband and come back. Notice that the heart of the hurt is the hurdle that the help must cross. And Jesus has reached to the heart of the hurt. And if you notice, this is the only time in the conversation that the woman does not say, Sir, it's probably a under the breath comment, I have no husband. She, she's not the feisty, crafty, aggressive woman. She's now almost deflated. I have no husband. And Jesus does not rebuke her. He doesn't say to her, you are an immoral woman. No, he, he says to her, you have answered correctly. Because you have had five. And the one you are now with is not your husband. And most of the time, if we're looking at it judgmentally, we think that Jesus is rebuking her, but he is speaking with great consideration and compassion. Think about these days in which she is living. To live, to be without a man is a great difficulty in society. That's why throughout the Old Testament you will see that one of the things that tithe must be used when it comes into the into the storehouse, into God's house. It must be used for widows and orphans and strangers at the gate, the vulnerable in society. And listen, she must be some woman because she has had five. Now, hold it. Here is the, the sense of the hurt. She's not in the powerful position. She's in the marginal position. That five would have included death of some because men died in wars very often. And she may have been divorced. Think of all the hurt that would have come with that. Here is the hurt, the pain, the suffering. And Christ is saying, I understand that. And Jewish law, and I think Sumerian law, permitted you to have two or three divorces. But not five. And I think it's because she had reached to the limit of how much she could go to help herself in this hard world that the one she was now with was not her husband. And when Jesus was speaking to her in those terms, he was, it, this is not a hidden fact, clearly. It wasn't hidden because that was the very reason she was coming at noon and not in the evening as usual because it was known and she wanted to avoid the people who were in. But, but here she had someone speaking to her about the, and, and, and seeing the great hurt in her life and was not rebuking and her, condemning her and ostracizing her and, as the others have done. 
And so her view of Jesus is not as a man and not as a Jew. She now says, I perceive you to be a prophet. She understands that by this compassionate, empathetic understanding of her hurt and seeking to help her, she was not speaking to any ordinary man. She was speaking to a man of God. But notice, she made, in verse 19, she makes no personal confession. She says, I recognize you as a prophet. And then she switches the conversation. She makes no personal confession. She asks for no forgiveness. But she says, listen, you are a man of God, yes. Where should we worship? Our fathers say we must do it in this mountain, and, 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 and the Jew says in, in Jerusalem, where is the place of worship? It's a strange shift from the nature of in the conversation. It seems she was shifting to take it off herself, you could say that. But there is another interpretation yet that she was speaking to that great longing that exists in all of our hearts. The longing after God, a deep desire to worship God. And that longing had been there and it had been suppressed by the hurt and the problems she had had. And here in the presence of a man of God, she decided to put the issue to him. But whether there, she was shifting the conversation away from herself and she, to, to ask a question, a controversial question of the time as to where to worship. Or she was answering to that deep, calling on to deep. She asked, where is the true place of worship? And notice she has now come to the same spiritual plane as Jesus. The conversation has shifted to the spiritual plane, and Jesus now answered, answers her about worship. God is spirit. Worship is not in terms of geography in this mountain or in Jerusalem. Worship is in spirit and in truth. Worship is turning to God in humble adoration, in deep confession, and reaching out to connect with God. It's like this, this, that hymn writer, Palmer, Rod Palmer, writing in 1830, My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary. Now hear me, while I pray, take all my guilt away. And from this day, let me be wholly thine. That is worship. And so Jesus speaks to her of what worship really is. Not place, but attitude of heart. Desire to connect with God with all of our faults and failings and frailties and failures to want to be wholly His. And she says to him, she postpones the question. She says, I can't argue with that. But when Messiah comes, he will explain everything. And it would appear that her answer was genuine because Jesus reveals himself to her directly in a manner that up to that date he had not yet so revealed in such a personal fashion to his own disciples. He says, you don't need to postpone this to when Messiah comes. He that speaketh to thee, am he. And at that point, 
she leaves the water jar. And she goes into the town to face the people who had formerly ostracized her and thought all sorts of things about her and knew her story and say, come see a man that told me everything ever I did. It's because she went out. Because notice that when the disciples came and saw Jesus with her, Jesus said nothing to them about the conversation. Jesus kept the conversation entirely confidential. And let me tell you something. If you are in counseling, you have to be confidential. There are some people that can't keep secrets, that can't keep anything. Don't go into counseling. If you are into counseling, it has to be confidential. Jesus kept it, but she couldn't keep it. And she went and testified publicly of what at her experience with it, and said, come see him yourself. And the villagers came. And the villagers came and said, Look, we're coming because of what you're saying, you know. They, they couldn't believe this is the same woman. <laughs> Not at all. But they say, stay with us two days. And afterwards, they say to her, we are not believing because of what you said. We are believing because of our own personal experience with this man who is the savior of the world. The gospel had come to Samaria. Jesus was not about to exclude them. When Sargon II removed Israel, the ten tribes from the north, and took them away and left the place desolate, he had sent some of his own people from Babylon and elsewhere to come populate there, and they had come up with a version of, Jew, of, of, of serving God. And because of that, the interbreeding on the one hand and the, 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 the mixture of idol worship with, with the service of Jehovah, the Jews excluded them. Jesus would not. Because you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for whosoever will. Regardless of background, gender, any of these things, race, all of these things that exclude people, have no account with Jesus. And he demonstrates this. And then he's not only concerned about the collective all but the personal. And he brings that home in his conversation with this woman, a conversation that transformed her and brought the gospel. And I close by saying that this is a conversation of dealing with a hurting woman. Thank God for those people who are concerned with the marginalized in society. Concerned with those who are hurting and not just standing in judgment of them. That is what is outside of the heart of Jesus when we only stand to condemn and to ill-treat and to mistreat the vulnerable and the marginalized, however they, are, they are, have become vulnerable. This morning I was reading Ezekiel chapter 34 where God is speaking to the shepherds who have not taken care of the sheep, who have simply exploited the sheep. Jesus is not, is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd that seeks the ones that are lost. There are 90 and 9 that safely lay, but he goes after the one 
who is astray. And the charge to us this morning is to see this heart of Jesus, understand how he operates, understand his compassion, his love, understand that it is a gospel of Jesus Christ, faith in him and faith in God that really transforms society and really transforms people. Yes, we should take time with them, but it is Jesus that changes, not time. And when we believe, our lives are changed because Jesus is not after the social and the historical. He's about the eternal. Would that every one of us this morning have found that well of water fresh flowing salvation in Jesus and indwelling by the Spirit that causes us to connect with the Father in worship, understanding that all of us, no matter where we have come from, we have a Father in heaven that we can say, Abba Father. And he knows us by name. And he takes care of us no matter what. And he gives us eternal life. Amen.